been a while. It's been like two weeks since I've done this. So, uh, but at this, I, I hope I haven't broken something, done something wrong here. I'm sure I'll figure it out. But at this point, people should see, be able to see us. So as always, we need people to acknowledge our existence. And, uh, and the second that happens, we can actually get started and I'll introduce you. <laughs> what? There we go. You exist. So wait a second. So you exist. So we exist. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to assume from Paranor's, uh, comment that, uh, that it's actually happening. All right. Well, Hey everyone, welcome to our Monday live QA. Uh, I'm Fraser Kane. Uh, this week I've brought a special guest. Um, a good friend, uh, Casey Dreyer from the Planetary Society. Casey, welcome. Welcome. I guess your first time joining me on my YouTube channel, but you've been a regular for the weekly space hangout. Thanks for hanging out, man. Of course. Happy to be here again. Uh, so for people who don't know uh, who you are and, and what you do, uh, why don't you give people the background? Well, I'm the director of space policy at the Planetary Society, which is the world's largest nonprofit space organization. So we do a lot of things at the society. We do uh, create projects like light sail that we're going to try to hopefully launch this year on the next Falcon Heavy. Uh, we also do a lot of outreach and education. And then we also do lots of advocacy and policy development, which is the program that I run. So I have a staff of two uh, people based in Washington, D.C., Matt Renninger and Jason Callahan. They're both experts in policy and government relations. And we try to organize and activate our membership to become engaged space advocates. We try to educate people and demystify the process of space policy. And we try to develop new policy solutions to advance the cause of planetary exploration, the search for life, and planetary defense uh, here on Earth. So it's a, it's a broad kind of mandate that we do, but really when you think about it, it comes down to using the organization, the, the membership of the Planetary Society, to influence the future of space exploration for the better, particularly here in the United States. And uh, I listen to a lot of podcasts, and I got to say that, I mean, I like Planetary Radio. Matt Kaplan is great, does a great job, wonderful guests. I'm jealous. But the part that I look forward to the most is this monthly space policy conversation roundtable that you and, and the people that you mentioned uh, do every month. It is this insight into the inner workings of the way spaceflight missions happen that I don't think really there's many people out there that cover this in any way, shape or form. And so for me, especially being so deep into the, the you know, I, I handle a lot of sort of what the outcomes are. I report on the uh, the new pictures that have come back from Hayabusa 2 and the, uh, you know, when someone uh, lands a mission on, on Mars. But this is like a sneak preview 10 years in advance, 15 years in advance of, of how all these missions uh, come together. So, um, I mean, like first, like, I'm a huge fan. Um, and uh, I would love to sort of know, how did, how did this idea of doing this Space Policy Roundtable, where did that come from? Sure, well, thank you. First, uh, yeah, Space Policy Edition, monthly on Planetary Radio. It's, it's a really fun thing to do for me and my colleague Jason Callahan, who is uh, my space policy advisor in DC. And the idea came from basically when I go to DC, I'm based in the West Coast. Uh, when I go to DC, I hang out with my colleagues, we have some beers, and we usually get into a long discussion about space policy and politics. And we just have a really good time going into it and going into the history and, and maybe letting off some steam here and there. But we wanted to capture that, a version of that, and that's really what Space Policy Edition is, where it's me and Jason, and we occasionally have guests, and, and Matt Kaplan joins us on the show, and we really talk about what's just happening in space policy, and let's talk about it as if the audience is into it. That's kind of the, right, uh, we don't have to apologize for it. We're all policy, we can be a policy wonk here on, on podcasts. You know, if you don't like it, you don't have to listen. And so we go into the details and the history and the discussions and the politics. And I really want to get down to why are things the way they are? You know, yeah. I, my background is a physics major uh, before I went into policy. And it's the same shared desire. How does the world work? Physics yeah. tells you that in a natural sense. Policy tells you that in a political sense. Um, and And I think that a lot of people don't realize it. Uh, there's so many situations where people say, 
oh, SLS, you know, the Space Launch System is a gigantic waste of money and SpaceX should be the one that's doing everything. And and I don't think that people really realize the all of the steps, like like even just like Space Launch System, the fact that this is the rocket system that the United States is building is a very complicated machine with a with not just the actual hardware itself but but all of the layers of politics and law that came together to make that exist right. so yeah can- it's a it's a perfect example of what are the motivations what are the real motivations of the space program who is the customer and that's some of the big questions for sls customers congress motivations are to get reelected so you can get lots of jobs in alabama texas Florida, other places. It does address national needs in a sense that it's like building an aircraft carrier, uh, but there is reasons for these things, right? And it's written, as you in, implied, it's written into law that NASA has to make it. So it's kind of a moot point regardless. Uh, you, <laughs> NASA would be breaking the law by not making it. Well, exactly. NASA would be breaking the law if they didn't make SLS. Yep. And like, exactly. as soon as you, like, if you think that NASA is has lost touch with reality because they're making SLS, you are blaming the wrong group of people, right? <laughs> so yes. now, now your specialty, I mean, the Planetary Society specialty is, is specifically really, I mean, you, you focus on a lot of this as well, but really specifically on planetary science. And, and you've had a bit of a, in planetary science, there's been a boom in the last couple of years. There's been some really good budget uh, for planetary science. What is the state of planetary science right now? Planetary science is in a process of rebuilding itself for the next generation, and which is itself an incredible turnaround from where it was just five years ago. Five years ago, you were looking at the total collapse of the program. And through a lot of the work that we did at the Planetary Society and professional groups and, and people like the, those listening and watching right now, we were able to turn those around, those cuts, those proposed cuts, and now we're actually making up for those cuts. We're we're in a situation where the budgets coming in are hundreds of millions above the presidential requests, and the presidential requests are themselves above anything we expected years ago. And what this is doing is that this is going to allow us to rebuild parts of the planetary science fleet, for lack of a better term, that we will not see now, but that we will see 10 years from now. And so we're still going to have a gap of missions. That is almost impossible to to prevent at this point. But the gap is going to be smaller, and it's going to be guaranteed to be short in certain ways compared to where we thought we were just a few years ago. So the biggest things coming forward, we have obviously the mission to Europa, the Clipper. We have a, a, a huge number, well, not a huge number, a good number of small missions, discovery class missions in the uh, being made right now to Psyche, the metallic asteroid, Lucy, um, a bunch of uh, Trojan asteroids further out. We have missions uh, that they're starting or trying to plan a sample return mission to follow on after the Mars 2020 rover to bring pieces of Mars back to Earth. And we have a real set of increases in technology, plutonium development, other things enabling technologies that are going to be useful for the future. The biggest questions going forward are, you know, particularly Mars, what do we do with the future of the Mars program? Can we get a regular cadence of missions to the outer planets? And how do we kind of manage these overall, you know, larger and larger projects so we don't get stuck in a situation where we have like the James Webb Space Telescope, where we have one project dominating the entire field for a generation? And so we're trying to work with balance, both in program and exploration. But we're really, as you pointed out, we are in a much better situation now than we were five years ago. And that's, I think, a real consequence of the advocacy. This is a, an advocacy success and finding ways to build support in the broader US Congress. So it's not just one or two people supporting this. This is a broad consensus that planetary science is important. And I, I you know, and again, in listening to the podcast, you could hear you guys um, sad and about <laughs> the, you know, your, the, your nervousness at the state of the future of funding. And then the work that you were doing to actually go to the Hill and speak with, with just an astonishing number of representatives there and then sort of the successes that you were having. So, I mean, 
I mean, I, I don't think you want to take credit for it, but, um, you know, what role do you think that the Planetary Society, that advocacy that you do, has on the, on the minds of the people who are making the votes and deciding on the budgets? I think we played a very important role. And I would even say our members played the most important role, right? Because fundamentally, representatives are there to represent you, right? It's in their name. And for issues like space and particularly issues like planetary science, where you don't have strong ideological commitments one way or another, people are open to hearing from their constituents. And with space, you don't have to get a lot of people on the same page to make a mark, right? You can get 10 people calling an office in one day, they start to pay attention because it's an issue they don't usually hear about. And so we've had tens of thousands of our members write and call and show up in Washington DC for this issue over the last five years. We had a consistent messaging and we worked with other professional organizations like the American Astronomical Society, and Division of Planetary Sciences, the American Geophysical Union, other organizations to be all on the same page with our messaging. And then, as you said, we just talked to a lot of people in Congress. Matt Renninger, our government relations manager, he is out on the Hill every day talking about these issues. And what it is, you're in a sense competing for the awareness, the mind space of people on Capitol Hill. They, they deal with so many issues. And so it's not like they necessarily dislike planetary science, they just get distracted or have other you know things calling at them and so you, you need to be there in person to grab a piece of their attention and hold on to it and make them deal with this issue and i we were a really critical part in doing that for the last five years and something that we're really proud of that we just put together this year we helped create a congressional caucus this the semi-formal interest group gathering of members of congress about planetary science so there's a planetary science caucus in the House and the Senate of the United States Congress right now because of the Planetary Society and because we had willing and excited uh, congressional representatives who wanted to pursue this and, and we just found it really interesting. So we're here to help them be better, more interested, members of Congress. We're here to educate them and we're here to get our members engaged so those same members of Congress hear from the people who vote for them that this is important. And once all those pieces come together, you can get motion here. And so we, again, we played a really critical role in that. Absolutely. Uh, now the, I've got, I want to definitely get to a bunch of questions from people. Um, Cause that's sort of why I like this, this, this live chat. So if you've got some questions for Casey, you know, as wonky as you want to get, uh, he can totally handle it. Um, so let's talk about a, a bunch of things right now. One is uh, space force. <laughs> sure, let's talk about Space Force. Um, and I know that, uh, you know, this is not necessarily directly in your wheelhouse, but it is this, theoretically, this long shadow. And, you know, the way I've been describing Space Force is, like, I'm, I want to hear some details. I can't imagine how you would take a bunch of Space Marines, pile them up in a spaceship, and send them off to patrol the far side of the moon. And in every other way, shape, and form, space is as militarized as the Outer Space Treaty will permit it. So what possible role do you think a, an actual space force will play above and beyond what exists right now and or to what is ridiculous? Well, so space force is an interesting issue where it sounds way more interesting than it actually is. I mean, that's what it comes down to. It, it, what it actually is, what space for, what's actually being proposed is a bureaucratic reshuffling of extant defensive intelligence gathering, national defense space programs into a different bureaucratic area. And that is basically it. It's an org chart shuffle. Yeah, it's an org, yeah you can think of it just broadly. It, it, and the arguments for that are that right now, the vast majority of, at least in the Pentagon and the Department of Defense, the vast majority of, of space defense and intelligence gathering is done by the Air Force. The Air Force is something like $140 billion uh, a year uh, in the United States uh, program. It's one of the major, obviously, branch of the Armed Forces. The space aspects of that are about 12-ish billion a year, so a, a tenth of that whole department. 
or, or branch of the armed services. And so the argument is, well, they don't get the attention that they would need if they had their own branch of the armed services, that then they could advocate for themselves internally, they could better procure and focus and advance their mission because that is their job. They answer to nothing else except being the best they can be, I suppose, in, in space. There's nowhere of this is going to be putting people into space, at least as of now, there's no real discussion about putting offensive weapons into space because of the implications to uh, overall, you don't want an arms race in, race in space. And a lot of people in Congress and observers of national security will tell you that it is in reaction to more aggressive steps being taken by adversarial countries to the United States, particularly China and Russia in regards to their anti-satellite and, and, and kind of other anti-space technologies that they're developing. So there is a reasonable argument for bureaucratic reshuffling. Uh, there's perfectly reasonable arguments against it, which is that it just adds a new layer of bureaucracy. It costs money to have an, a separate hierarchy above and uh, in addition to the hierarchy of the Air Force, that it still won't be that big of a branch of the armed services, just maybe more of like uh, the Coast Guard, which is much smaller than the Army, Air Force, or um, uh, other parts of the of, of the services. And so it won't make that big of a difference, but you'll be spending a few, right now the estimate is $13 billion additional over the next five years just to add the extra bureaucracy to it. So it is a big, it is a very unusually public debate over an internal Defense Department bureaucratic reorganization. And those happen a lot. They're not fun. They're usually not that interesting. Um, but we hear Space Force and we get we think about, you know, Space Marines, right? Or yeah. Starship Troopers or, or whatever. So it's it's one of those things where, again, I feel like it's really going into it. I'm still that, that much more interested in it. Um, but it sounds provocative. And, of course, it got inserted into the partisan politics right now. And it became hyper everything because of that. Uh, I mean, what if they'd called it Starfleet? <laughs> well, they, then it'd be coming out of the Navy. So it, <laughs> I guess so. You know, like it's just, <laughs> I, you know, Space Force, Starf Starfleet just has all these Star Trek connotations. And so, I, you know, I think that would have worked a little better, in my opinion. Um, but I, I totally agree. It's like I, I've been racking my brain to try and think of anything apart from giving the National Reconnaissance Office a bigger telescope to scan Earth with. Right, like they're not going to send. I mean, a, the, the, the strange thing about this is, as at least as the last time I checked this, that the the National Reconnaissance Office and the other intelligence gathering services are would not be wrapped up in Space Force and would continue to exist separately. So there's the Air Force activities about twelve billion. That's my about twelve billion hand sign. And then you have all of the intelligence gathering services, which is about another ten ish billion National Reconnaissance Office, Geospatial Intelligence Agency, and so forth, that will then continue to be doing their thing. And so this, again, is only a part of the national security apparatus in space. So again, debatable, and right now running into a significant amount of opposition, particularly in the Senate, uh, to, to moving it forward. So it may be a long time before, if ever, that we see movement on this. Yeah. The president cannot just, to, to, you know, decree a new branch of the armed services into existence and you're you've got it like it's just this funny thing you know as as i think i'm sure it's happened to you guys as well but for us being out there on the front lines getting the comments from people on my youtube that video it's just like it's it's somehow this idea is all of the hopes and dreams of ufo conspiracy theorists and that that now finally Trump is going to reveal the the dark truth about the about the uh, the cover ups of the UFOs, and at the same time we're going to have a, a military group that's going to head out and protect Earth from the alien invasions. But as you you know, I think I, I agree with you. Uh, org chart shuffle. Um, yeah. If you're uh, really into uh, standing up new bureaucracies in the world's largest bureaucracy right um we'll love space force curious borg says let's talk about what's really important what will the uniforms look like <laughs> so well that's the thing we don't have they're not going to be deploying troops there's no service troops in this there's a uh, there are people who right now they're members of the air force space command or not space command but the, the service who, who does all the space activities 
they're working in rooms with computer screens yeah. monitoring all of the satellites that are in space and keeping communication lines open and and early warning systems you know they they're wearing regular uniforms or suits probably with ties yeah yeah whatever the military version of a computer nerd looks like um, right. <laughs> uh, all right so question from Oh, where was it here? Uh, oh, from Educating Space. Uh, Casey, how can planetary society members in other countries, such as Australia, help with adv advocacy aligned with that of the planetary society? So you are focused on the United States, um, understandable. I'm Canadian. Um, how can you help us and how can we help you? Yeah, so the biggest thing I think we can do is finding ways to be engaged in your own uh government and it it becomes difficult so one of the let me just step back and say one of the reasons why we focus on the u.s it's just a we we're here we know how it works the cultural stuff obviously is is, is easier to figure out um the u.s government is is unusually open actually in terms of having pathways for citizens to weigh in on a variety of decisions um particularly with space and we have the most members here so for our second highest place is actually Canada and Australia are, I think, in our top five uh, membership for countries. We actually have ways in which we've been working with supporting what the Australians have, been, particularly the Australians in this case, have been doing by standing up their own uh, space agency. And in those situations, actually what we're looking for are volunteers who want to be that Rosetta Stone to say, we understand well how our government works where the, the political landscape lies and identifying areas that you can find ways to engage people to move something forward in space. If you can find something like that, you can reach out to us and we can find ways to promote that. We also have uh, staff based in Canada. We're also like, participating in a lot of the um, Canadian policy discussions in terms of investing in science and space in Canada. And you know, those are some ways we're trying to build the excitement. And I think actually even the most simple thing that we can do is to get people in your countries excited and committed to the idea of space, making it relevant, making it important, because socializing the idea is the first step into making policy succeed, right? You have to have fertile ground in a sense for the successful policy to take root. And particularly in Australia, where there has not been a full space program before, a space agency, making it worth it to the the future governments who aren't the government that created the space agency to future voters making sure that it's always going to be relevant and i think there are ways that people see that space is interfacing I actually wrote about this in the latest issue of the planetary report that space is interfacing with uh, uh, promoting commerce and research and development in addition to the scientific joy of discovery that we get from it as well so finding ways to just spread the word is just the most basic thing you can do and then if you're really into politics and you have ideas that you can see that we could help with, you can feel free to write to me and we can talk about that. Uh, so let's talk about some recent th uh, things that are coming up. And this is and one I'd like to go into a little bit is about the state of the lunar gateway. Um, is it a gateway? Is it a no gateway. doorway? It is is a it a, um, uh, so where are we at now with NASA's new mandated uh, rules, law, to potentially go to the to return to the moon and head off to Mars? Where do we exist along that timeline now? So 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 that's not actually a law. Oh, it's that, not law yet. That's Sorry. a presidential directive. That's a, that's setting national space policy. So that is now the official policy of the United States. Is not that is uh, does not have the force of law behind it, but it's very right. important. So they don't go to um, jail if they don't put people on the moon. <laughs> right. You just get fired. You just get basically. fired. Right. <laughs> uh, well, so the gateway is in an interesting situation. The the money has been so the money has been requested the, for what's called a new start. That NASA has officially requested permission from Congress to start a program, to start spending money on it. it. In the presidential budget request, which is kind of how this begins, the White House puts together this long request for what NASA needs for the upcoming fiscal year, and then it projects out a few years saying, this is what we intend to do over time. And though that is just a request, it basically lays out the administration's policy of what it intends to do. Congress then takes that as the initial starting points of the funding discussion for that year, 
Congress can then decide to give the money requested, not give the money requested, give more, give less, not at all, so forth and so on. Congress has not acted yet. The fiscal year begins today, actually. Happy new fiscal year, everybody. It's fiscal year 2019 in the United States. And the government in the United States ha is now partially funded for 2019, but the other half, basically half of it is not. That half includes NASA. It's on an extended stopgap measure where they have extended authority from the last year. So NASA in this situation, they cannot end any programs. They can't start any programs. And so they're kind of in a holding pattern with Gateway because it has been requested but not formally approved. And they've been spending some money on doing early studies. You've had a broad agency announcement for it. You've had the Next Step 2 program giving millions of dollars to a number of companies to develop prototypes and have it, you know, what would you build with it? NASA has money to study concepts and put things together, but they can't really get started on this program until Congress authorizes its existence and funding for it. Um, the funding would jump up to about half a billion dollars in 2019, uh, which seems to be where Congress was going with it, but right now they don't have that money. And so there, it's, it's kind of like a horse waiting to jump out of the gate you know, we don't, the timeline, I, I, I don't know you enough yet really to see if a 2022 is realistic for its first element. It seems possible. They'd have to get, you know, you don't want to be wasting these months though. So I'm sure they're moving what they can and they're moving what they can within the law. Um, but long-term program commitments just cannot be made unless Congress has already authorized the program. So we need to get that going first. So, I mean, you have a gut instinct for how this is going to play out probably better than anyone I know. Do you think this is going to happen? Do you think this is going to be written into law and there will be projects and programs and people and astronauts tasked with setting foot on the moon? I think the gateway has the highest likelihood of happening in the next decade. I'll put it that way. Yeah. Um, and, and then I guess, and this sort of plays into a, a question that I actually got here. Um, uh, does from Grant Lanning, does the Planetary Society advocate at all in the private space industry? So what role, sort of how do you advocate with private companies? Yeah, so private companies are a little different because they're private, right? They're, they're, it's, they generally do not adhere or require government policy to exist or to pursue things. Um, however, there are areas in that government, particularly in regulatory systems, are very important to private companies. And so generally the society does not say pro-private, let's do this because they're private. We're focused on our broad program goals. So planetary exploration. Are there ways to lower the cost of planetary exploration through investing in lower cost rockets? Yes, right? So to, in that sense, to the ends that they serve our prime goals, that's generally where we intersect with them. Um, having a vibrant private space ecosystem is just going to be an important for the country in the future and for the future of exploration, just to bring in new ideas, new opportunities. Moon Express and uh, actually Moon Express and Astrobotic are both uh, supporting members of the Planetary Science Caucus. Um, there's lots of interesting intersections for us in there, but we don't specifically go out and just because they're private support that it's more of an integrated approach that we take. Um, Astro YYZ is asking for a light sail update. <laughs> I'm the policy guy, man. I don't know. What's that. No, that... Come on. You must've talked to somebody, you know, <laughs> gone into the room where they're working on it, checked it out. Yeah. Well, so light sail too is built and ready to go. We are waiting for our ride. And in to that sense, all I know is that we are no earlier than November 30th for a ride on the Falcon Heavy. Um, I would say generally SpaceX uh, runs on the late side of its ambition, of its uh, uh, schedule ambitions. I, I um, heard we were, uh, we just, uh, I was hanging out, hanging out with some people and we came up with the term Elonian years. <laughs> so they're, That's they're about two and a half of, yeah. Earth years long. <laughs> well, I believe it's relative to how close you are to his center of gravity. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, it's uh, right now, I mean, light sail is built. Yeah, we are, we are, it is there. It is waiting for its ride, which is very exciting for us, as you might imagine. So the so everything from the first time around, we've improved the software, improved the hardware. 
We've improved everything about it. It is ready to attempt true solar sailing. Just got to get up into space. And we will let you know as soon as we know when yeah. that's going to be. And nobody else is this far along in the development of, of a solar sail, which is kind of, I know the Japanese did a test. You guys already tried to do a test and it didn't work out so well. Um, well, it was a, well, that was the Cosmos one. Uh, yeah. We did do an engineering demonstration of the deployment of, so that was light sail one. So the, all that was supposed to do was deploy. Um, it did. So we, that was a, a, a successful test. It did have some hiccups along the way. Um, but yes, I mean, particularly for a CubeSat, uh, we're very excited and, and, you know, we, again, private, privately funded and privately built CubeSat. There's a couple missions from JPL coming up. Uh, I believe in 2019 or 2020 that will demonstrate some uh, solar sail capabilities in, in CubeSats as well. Um, but we're definitely the first private organization to have built one of these. Yeah. Uh, it's just it's just one of the it's one of those ideas that makes no sense. Everyone's run the math, and you know if it can be integrated there is a lot of ways that like almost any spacecraft could just have one of these solar sails on board for when the occasional disaster hits it needs to just when you think about like hayabusa one that just barely made it back to earth with a tiny little sample if it had a solar sail on board who knows what uh, additional stuff could have could have gotten done there's a lot of missions that could have just been at least saved it's almost like a like a life raft <laughs> yeah, it's just a cool it's just a cool thing to experiment with, right? And you see it yeah. already being you know proposed in the Starshot uh lights, you know, solar sails with the little space chips that they're using. Uh solar sails they're uh, I, I I don't remember where in development this is, but JPL was looking at a solar sail that could simultaneously reflect down onto the surface of the uh, of the planet to illuminate areas, shaded areas with oh, its that's lights a great idea. as well. Um, there's a ton of cool uses. And again, the more that individuals, private groups, industry and government experiments with new ways of doing things, you know, they won't always work kind of by definition of experimenting, but that's how you start to move the ball. And that's what's so interesting, I would say, about this time that we're alive right now in the space business, that we're seeing a lot of experimentation begin to happen again. And we hadn't seen that in a long time. Um yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, there's a lot of these technologies that we find out about uh, that people are testing, and yet the time frame that it takes from when the idea comes about to when an actual deployment happens. I think a great example of this was like the ion propulsion system that now a lot of spacecraft are using. The Japanese are using it. The um, the you know, dawn mission etc and yet it, it sort of for nasa to actually put it into space the first time they went with the deep space one mm -hmm. spacecraft and it was just like they gathered together a dozen different experiments to put them on one spaceship each of which they were too afraid or considered too risky to test in a production environment but together they could make a you know a, a one big experiment machine fly around <laughs> in space and i th i thought that was a great way to to go about it um and I guess this is, you know, I, I don't get a lot of people who I can kind of rant about this with, but you're, I think you're just the guy. Um, and back to this idea that NASA is planning, or Congress wants NASA, <clears throat> potentially, the president wants NASA to send humans back to the moon and on to Mars. What's to stop this from just, we've seen how this goes there was the constellation program there was the asteroid initiative there was uh the previous bush's to Mars. plans to go Probably back to, to Mars. the moon there was the you know the yeah all of these right it's moon mars moon mars moon mars and nothing goes goes anywhere and there is this great alternative uh proposal that came out of nasa called the capabilities driven architecture and i'm a gigantic fan of this i of this idea i don't know i don't know if you know the, the gist of it it's that you, you you just try to increase the capabilities of your of nasa every year so and the i feel like like the classic example of this was the gemini program where they they took astronauts and they kept them alive in space for a little bit longer and then they tried doing a docking and then they tried um if they could do some kind of rotational um gravity and then they tried keeping them alive in space in this tiny spacecraft for two weeks 
and each time they just just made it more and and it feels like there isn't this in between stage where they should just be going like the moon would be great but let's get the capability of NASA to the point where the moon is an afterthought. You're like, yeah, we could go down to the moon if we wanted to, or we could land on an asteroid or whatever, because we have all these capabilities that we have built up. And, and to keep setting this gigantic long term goal, and then canceling it just keeps you in orbit around the Earth on the space station. <laughs> well, that's true. But also don't forget the space station was in itself, a long term goal for about all of NASA's history pretty much until it began. So those can work. I, and I guess I'll, I, I'm going to disagree a little bit here on your characterization of Gemini because Gemini was testing technologies that they knew they were going to need for the moon, right? They, they had this goal that constrained how they prioritize limited resources. So that's the value I see in, in having a goal capabilities driven and we're actually what we have now is a strange hybrid i think of, of the two fundamentally where the sls is being pitched as a capabilities driven program you build a heavy lift capability and what well, i don't know what we do with it. let's do some stuff with it and so that's why you see it being used as you can throw stuff at jupiter direct you can put space really big space telescopes up there you could send a full stack sample return program to Mars, or you can send people to the moon, or you can send people to Mars, um, so forth and so on. That was actually designed, and, and I believe it's referred to in the NASA Authorization Act of 2010 as a capabilities-driven program. So at the same time, when you have capabilities-driven program, how do you decide, assuming that NASA will never have infinite funds, which I think is a safe assumption, um, how do you then prioritize your limited resources. And I, I, I feel that without some sort of long range goal or approach or timeline, you don't have an easy way to answer that question. And what you end up then doing instead is doing the politically convenient way of spending that resources as opposed to the long term important way of spending those resources. And it doesn't always mean that we need like a like send humans to the moon kind of a goal because let's not forget the whole scientific side of nasa they set their goals in 10-year increments via a process called the decadal survey process through the national academies of sciences where you basically go through an 18-month argument with the scientific community about what are the biggest questions in the science what types of missions would answer them how important is it to answer them in the next 10 years that gives NASA, the Congress, the White House, a sense of these are the important things that we can organize and coalesce around. And we can have a coalition of people bought into that because they believe in this process. You don't have anything like that for human spaceflight. Mainly, I think, because human spaceflight does not have the constraints imposed upon, imposed upon it by having an external framework of decision making. Science, a bunch of scientists, it's always clear in, in the state of science what the biggest questions are. Those biggest questions will drive consensus. Human spaceflight ultimately comes down to it's an engineering problem and there's no objective answer saying is the moon better than Mars? Is Mars better than the moon? Should we orbit first? Should we land first? Those aren't, there's no external framework that tells you the answer to any of those in an objective sense so with human spaceflight you kind of come back what you 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 kind of shift to these goals and then what actually has happened has been when those goals have lined up with a national priority separate national priority then suddenly you have that external framework to drive consensus and then it happens so the two big, biggest examples of this apollo Cold War, right? Instead of fighting the Russians directly, we we go to space and you know we show off our plumage and no one has to fight us because we demonstrate our capability. Um, space station didn't actually happen. It was in the talks and talks and talks and talks. The Soviet Union collapsed. You wanted to make sure the all the rocket scientists and other scientists at the Soviet Union, ex-Soviet Union, didn't go off and work for Iran and North Korea. So NASA ended up basically keeping them in business by integrating them into the space station program and as a consequence of the end of the cold war we have a space station and also to give the shuttle something to do um so you have these when you have particularly national security alignments with spaceflight 
then things tend to happen. And so the question is, coming up, do we have that opportunity? No one knows, right? We don't have a clear. You see people trying to position China as the next external threat, so you have to be at the moon because China's going to the moon. That's a little reactionary for me to think of it that way. I think you can find the alternative way that the society has proposed about this has been you take a long-term approach that has a goal that gives you guidance locally, right? And so you something that so you can go to the moon before you go to Mars, but if Mars is your goal, that the needs that you will have at Mars should inform every process, every step that gets you there always, even if you're going to the moon in the first place. So the gateway is actually a really good way to start doing that. And it's also a realistic way in terms of budget. It's not the most exciting in terms of returning to the moon uh, on, on, you know, with, with footsteps, but I mean, just frankly, we just don't have the money to do it and no one is willing to pony it up. You know, we, we've had, even under this president, uh, NASA has done better than almost any other federal agency in the context that it's, it's been cut the least, or at least proposed to be cut the least. Um, and Congress has added money, but, you know, 5% every year or so. And it allows us to kind of keep the program we have, but we don't have the money, at least as we're doing things now, to do things radically different. You're seeing experimentation begin to happen with the public-private partnerships. And that's going to be, to me, that's the this is the X factor that's different this time, that you have the, the potential integration of a broad coalition of private entities that have skin in the game. And we will, it's yet to be proven that they will all show up or if they will just request the same type of government assistance or contracts that other companies have done in the past. So that to me is the different opportunity here. There's also a lot of practical things with the moon that just makes it easier to, <laughs> to just get there. Um, it's faster, you have more launch opportunities, you, communications uh, issues are much easier to deal with. All of that stuff makes it easier for companies and other nations to participate, and that's maybe how this time could be different. Uh, I got oh man, I, you just like so many things now buzzing in my head. <laughs> so with the the lunar, what are we calling it now? I apologize, the, gateway. the lunar gateway. The okay, gateway. lunar gateway. Yeah. Um, I mean, I agree that that it does sort of push the capabilities that up until now the international space station it's close it's pr getting people from the space station back down to earth is a is a one hour uh bumpy ride and you're back on the planet if there's a medical emergency uh you're protected by the magnetosphere of the earth so the energy requirements to get people up there the the radiation shielding that's required i mean there are definitely that alone building the gateway alone is a dramatic next step to to send crew beyond earth and to learn a whole bunch of new lessons about living in deep space so <clears throat> whether or not they ever go to, to land on the moon i think going to the gateway is a perfectly reasonable next step for for nasa to take um you talked a bit about uh so i kind of half agree with you I, or in this case at least Doing the gateway is a perfectly reasonable next step. Although they really need to build the Nautilus X. I don't know if you remember the Nautilus X. This was a, a rotating um, uh, part portion that was going to be pr proposed for the International Space Station. It would only cost a couple of billion dollars and would help figure out if there's a way to provide some kind of rotational artificial gravity, which is really one of the big questions to, to figure out. It's sort of but it's th literally they couldn't afford it and so it's still not being attached to the lunar gateway um this idea of a new race a new space race in this case with the chinese um do you i mean like on the one hand a lot of people are are hoping that chinese footprints on the surface of the moon are going to ignite this new space race i'm not so sure my guess is unless there's some actual dramatic military component to it, it's just going to be applause and, uh, you know, um, go ahead and find a spot that's, you know, not on, near our flags to put your own flag up. And by ours, I mean yours, not ours. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like it's done. You're an right? honorary, uh, yeah, right? You're yeah. An honorary, you know, it, 
Um, the flag is there. The 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 yeah. first footprints on the moon exist, and if the Chinese pull it off, it's dramatic. But it's already been done. Yep, and I I'm similar. I, I think you would see maybe some speeches lamenting this on the congressional floor. I'm very doubtful you would see the money yeah. show up for a serious response. And, and I mean, let's not forget. I mean, so may, we can maybe talk about this again as we approach more Apollo. Uh, 50th anniversaries here but apollo we, we we all have to remind ourselves about the utter unlikelihood of apollo like it, it <laughs> never should have happened it was a, it was a conflict there, there was just like such an unusual series of events that happened to make it a reality it, it, we have to remember it was not just the cold war it was about as Cold War as the Cold War got, right? I mean, this was a, a period of, of incredible levels of secrecy of the Soviet Union. You had the United States shocked out of its complacency about being protected by oceans. Those disappeared the moment that Sputnik first flew over, that after 200 years of American isolationism, we suddenly felt vulnerable. You had the whole context of a geopolitical bipolar arrangement between communism and capitalism happening in the context of decolonialization where you literally had dozens of countries around the world newly deciding what types of governments to uh to to order themselves in those nothing like that exists anymore even though china's nominally communist we're no longer competing for the so-called hearts and minds of these newly decolonized decolonized states uh, we have a much more, uh, we are socialized to the idea of spacecraft overhead, nuclear war, broader global catastrophes are just more, we're more aware of. And we have the uh, unquestioned lead in space technology and capability in this country. So all of those conditions that were required for Apollo, I mean, you literally had Kennedy writing a memo to Johnson, who was the chair of the space group at the time, saying, is there anything we can do to beat the Soviets? Because remember, this happened, the Apollo decision came in the wake of Yuri Gagarin and the Bay of Pigs invasion failure, which was a big black eye in this young president's uh, uh, image, and he needed to reassert American leadership. And so the moon landing was the only thing they thought they could beat the Soviets in because they didn't actually know the state of the Soviet space program, which was not as advanced as it appeared to be at the time because it was so shrouded in secrecy. And the Chinese do something like that. We're not suddenly going to beat them to Mars. Um, it'll be, ah, I remember how the US used to lead maybe, and then maybe, maybe you would get an extra billion or so dollars. But after Apollo was announced, the NASA's budget doubled and then the next year it doubled again. So that showed you the actual priority of that. Yeah. Um, for that to happen again, you would almost have to have an unfathomable and very scary set of things to happen uh, right. to motivate people to do right. this. Right, so, so the, the series of events, sequence of events that led up to the space race, you do not want. Right, yeah, it was a very scary time to be alive and we flirted right. with uh, total self-annihilation. Right. So I will take fewer moon landings if we're not on the brink of thermonuclear right. so if the if the chinese figure out a way to um to reach to, out to other dimensions <laughs> right and now we have a dimension race yes the, there's a dimension gap where we're attempting to win yeah. the hearts and minds of the different dimensions yeah. this is the this is sort of the situation that we're that we would be getting to. So I think that's great. Um, now, you, as part of the Planetary Society, are about to go into sort of you, you mentioned it briefly, the equivalent of Planetary Science Olympics uh, with the decadal survey every 10 years. Uh, planetary scientists, really scientists across all of space science and many other kinds of science come together and they agree on their priorities, and from those priorities come the missions. Uh, now you get to kind of predict what kinds of missions are, do you think people are gonna be decided upon, what kinds of big goals, and what are some of the really cool, exciting things that people should be looking forward to? 
So I will answer this one carefully because so the process is for the scientific community. We generally support that. But here's what I anticipate people talking about. And ultimately what the process is going to do, it will be to try to filter those out and rank and prioritize the extent you can, um, which are the most important ideas. So my guess is that you will see a big push towards ocean worlds exploration uh, in the next decadal survey particularly for Titan and Enceladus, not just Europa. Um, perhaps even a recommendation for a, a program devoted to ocean worlds exploration, which has been kicking around for a while. Uh, you will see a big push again from the Venusian community, the, oh. the leaguered, uh, yeah. <laughs> the poor, uh, the poor Venusians. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, they're, they're working into it. So, I mean, the way, well, let me just step back and say, it, the way it worked, at least in the last decadal survey, is that they ranked in priority order the large flagship missions. And with the assumption that you do maybe one, one and a half to two flagships per decade, right? We're, we're actually an extraordinary that we have two flagships in production right now, Mars 2020 and Europa Clipper. But both of those are kind of half price flagships. And so we're kind of getting a two for one deal. Um, then you have the idea that you're doing a maybe two to three medium missions and for those, they give a, a, a just a non-ranked but limited list of destinations and mission types for new frontiers. Um, so we had like a Trojan mission tour, a Venus mission, a Saturn probe, so forth and so on as options for those. And then you have Discovery, which is the smallest ones, and they don't make recommendations. They just say, surprise us, because those are small. Just make sure they're scientifically valid that meet up with NASA's big picture stuff. So again, for those big ones, really, that we're talking about, you're going to see a big battle between ocean worlds, the ice giants, Venus and, and Uranus, which were the number three ranked uh, flagship missions last time around, and Mars, because the Mars community will not be finished with Mars sample return. So right. I think you're going to see a big kind of debate about what is the highest priority to complete sample return in the next decade, decadal period or to really go out and look for life in some of these ocean worlds. And and that's going to be following on on what Europa Clipper is doing by analyzing it's going to have a an ice penetrating radar on board to try and map out the the water where the water is yeah, underneath the, in the, ice. the ice shell the, right and that would and then for... define the characteristics of of some kind of lander submarine drill machine what have you and and that's a very i mean obviously to be able to actually get down into into the ice would be super intriguing um a return mission to uranus and or neptune would be wonderful why can't venus get some love um uh there's like there's too many targets to to pick i mean that's the yeah. hardest part right it is well and the hard part too when they're being when, when they're going to be deciding this uh, you won't even have the data from Clipper yet, right? Because yeah. again, Clipper won't even launch earliest now, 2022, maybe mid 2020s. It gets that means it gets to Europa and starts collecting data by at the earliest 2029, 2028, um, or later. And so they're going to be. This is always the problem with uh, ocean worlds and outer planets is that you don't have like Mars or Venus. A, a short enough uh, time for looping through development, travel, gathering of the data, and then processing the data. And Mars, you can do that in a two-year cadence and always have something new to pop out to Mars at every launch opportunity that builds on the last mission. Really hard to do with Uranus or Neptune or, or Triton or Titan or Enceladus or any of the ocean worlds unless you have something like the SLS that launches you out there with a three-year travel time and you have a bigger cadence of missions you can do. So that's going to be a difficult thing. And you're going to have, again, an enormous amount of pressure for Mars because you have already will have gathered the samples with Mars 2020. And then you just need to go get them. Right. <laughs> just need They're, to go get them. Right. It's going to poop them <laughs> out on the ground. And go. now you just need to go yeah. get them. Yep. All you got to do is have a, a remote launch off of another planet um on <laughs> right all you gotta, that's it that's all yeah is yeah what could be too one of the most that. complicated and energy intensive missions that's ever been attempted <laughs> is all that's required um so that's gonna be yeah that's gonna be an interesting debate to watch and that'll start happening um in 2020 
So beginning next year, sorry, next fiscal year, um, which is fiscal year 2020 now. All right. <laughs> Let's say 18 months or so. <laughs> Start looking for stuff happening. Um, so we've got about five minutes left. Uh, I had a couple of questions that came in here. Um, Arjon was asking, how do you create a grass mo grassroots movement for any particular change in laws so that uh, people call the congressperson about making that change? What about any, I mean, what lessons can other people learn from the success sure. of the Planetary Society? Uh, well, first, let me plug my uh, Space Advocacy 101 online course. It's free. Um, it's uh, at courses.planetary.org. It's, uh, it's a new thing, and, and it kind of touches on a lot of those things I'm about to say. Uh, it's a really good insight into what we've been doing, and it's, it's as much as it's the course that I wish that I had when I had first started in this field. Um, so that's Space Advocacy 101. So that's the plug for that. But really, to answer that question, I think it, first I would say you, you want to identify one or two things, right? So you keep your goals straightforward and simple and easy to understand, at least broadly. And you work on clarifying what do I want, what will achieve what I want, and then communicate that to people in a way that they engage with, right? So find an engaging way to share that. And then you can say, and, and I'd say to really be effective at it, you need to have either doing some legwork on your own first and then following it up with a grassroots movement in a sense because people everywhere are really great to emphasize something but most people don't have the time frankly to to get really deep into the weeds on politics that's 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 not a judgment that's just mm -hmm. life right there are reasons why we have specialization um, in our society now so if you can do the work in advance, can you, can you contact some of the critical congressional offices? Can you, can you figure out what types of legislation would advance your issue? Can you even write out example legislation and get congressional staff to get their boss interested in it, to submit it, whatever? Then you can engage people around the activity to push that through. So people, the, grassroots is kind of a blunt instrument right? Because it, it, it's like you have to have an idea that people can engage, communicate themselves easily over a quick phone call or emails or something to their members of Congress and do it in a way that then the recipients of that message in congressional offices will tie it to action. Like, is there a legislation that they can tie it to? Is there some activity they can do that's already set up? Are they familiar with the idea? And this is why with like the Planetary Society, one of the important things that we do is that we have that those people in Washington, D.C., socializing these ideas, communicating with these offices. So by the time we ask you to do something, the offices have heard about it before, and you're putting the exclamation point on it. You're putting the motivation. You're putting the effort behind it. And it's adding that legitimacy and the demonstrating uh, – you're, you're demonstrating that there is constituent interest in it. So that's really – I'd say you have to do legwork in advance and then use grassroots people in an engaged, clear – way to to move something through right uh we'll get just a couple of minutes left so uh now how can people get involved in the planetary society <laughs> oh it's my favorite topic i know i know i know you... uh well the, the most important thing anyone can do is join the planetary society as a member um it starts at four bucks a month uh you, you get the magazine you get to have that warm feeling about really making a difference with something uh because we can't do anything unless we can do stuff, right? We have the resources to do stuff. After you join as a member, uh, check out planetary.org slash uh, space advocate. Uh, you can, it's on our website. And you have a number of things you can start to do. You can take the online class. You can follow us on Planetary Radio or Space Policy Edition. We have petitions that are up. Or you can even sign up to join us in Washington, D.C., uh, March 3rd and 4th of 2019. We're going to be meeting with a bunch of members. We're going to be scheduling office visits uh, for members of Congress, and you'll get to hang out with me and the other guys in the policy program and talk about space uh, while you're there. So that'll, those are a number of things you can do to get more involved. Great. And just go to planetary.org to, uh, to find out more. Uh, Casey, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. Uh, like I said, I'm a huge, uh, I've, I have become a policy with space policy wonk and I really enjoy the, uh, sort of hearing how 
this all comes together. It makes me do a better job of what I do uh, in, you know, keeping that in context. And it sort of, I find it really kind of grounding to hear how it all comes together. So thank you for making the show uh, and to all of your, your co-hosts. And I hope you guys, if you're like wondering like, oh, should we keep doing this? Just remember that Fraser's listening, and so you know that you need to keep you need to keep working on it. You're you're stuck forever. All right, we won't disappoint you, man. We're here All for right, you. thanks a lot. Uh, thanks everyone for watching us today. Uh, if you enjoyed this, give a thumbs up. Um, subscribe if you haven't already, and definitely check out uh, planetary.org and um, and follow uh, Casey on Twitter. All right, thanks everyone. We'll see you all next week.